had a green light and everything. If you lived on County Road 76, it depends. Hey, there I am. 76 down here, where Jimmy Ellis lived. If you lived on Jimmy's side of the road, you wasn't in Lexington School Zone. But if you lived where Tony Hurston lived on the other side of the road, you was in Lexington School Zone. It was difficult to tell that to people, especially if they was already aggravated when they called you. Uh, people in Center Hill, Alabama, they could, didn't realize that just because they lived on the Lexington Mail route, they wasn't in Lexington School Zone. Because Arkdale Bridge at the foot of the hill, that's where our school zones ended. This day and time, we, they're trying to find bus drivers left and right. So if you got a CDL, you can get you a job. Some places they even pay for you to go to school. If you don't have a CDL, then uh, get your CDL. Lawrence County, Tennessee, I'd never heard of such. Any given day, there'll be four or five buses ain't running. And I asked the kids, I said, uh, how do you get home? What time do you get home? Well, the bus gets back here at school, gets us about 4 o'clock. We usually get home about 5.30. I'm done, Miss Karen, I'm done finished with supper, ready for my second go around by, the, by, that, by 5.30. So people would call me, Marty, uh, how, did, how did I get my bus license? I said, well, there's a test you got to take. And uh, if you you got to identify every part on the bus. And if you don't know all the parts, my brother's bus has it all labeled. Mr. Larry Davis, big star man, his wife, Jimmy Lou, drove that bus before Roger did. And Larry labeled every part of that bus that she had to name. The one that comes to mind is the slack adjuster. I don't know what that does. Bob, you might be able to tell me what that does. I don't know what that does, but it was labeled. And people that did not have the bus labeled, they usually missed the slack adjuster because they didn't know what in the world it was. Well, if we've got a slack adjuster on that, it's, surely it's used somewhere. They had to pass it, had to name it on the test, pass it, and they had to redo that every year. Here's a question I got for us this morning. What's God given us? If we're a child of God, he's given us something. Let's not let it be like that slack adjuster and nobody know what. Oh, yeah, that's, that's right over here. It's, see, it's labeled right here. Let's be using what the Lord has given us. Let's look at Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes to the church at Rome, writing to us, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say to you through the grace given unto me that to every man that is among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace which is given to us, for the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching, he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. He that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheer cheerfulness. So these first two verses here are usually, uh, they're the ones I usually read, and we go on and we 
talk about other things, but this morning, not only these first two verses, but let's take a look at verses 3 through 8. My Bible's got a headline there. It says, Service. And I hope this morning that if we're born again children of God, that we realize what gifts. Now, this is not the only gift list there is in the Bible. There's another in Ephesians 4. There's another in 1 Corinthians 12, I believe it is. But this is one we're uh, going to look, like, uh, look at tonight, this morning. One group of writers say this about the first two verses, and then we're going to move on to the service list of uh, gifts. This is the very thing which believers should seek. To be acceptable and well-pleasing to God. So many times on the job, we want to be well-pleasing to our boss. We want to be well-pleasing. And if we're all the boss, we want to be well-pleasing to the employees. Maybe we want to be well-pleased to the customers and the education. That, that's the students. That's the parents. That's the families. But what about acceptable and well-pleasing to God? We should seek to cause him to joy and rejoice in our bodies. Our bodies should be dedicated, so pure, holy, and clean, so committed, involved in helping people that God's heart is just flooded with joy and rejoicing. And by the way, it does say there at the end of verse 1, which is our reasonable service. He's given so much for us. What are we giving to him? Verse 2 says that uh, we ought not be conformed to this world. The word translated uh, transformed is metamorphosis. I just slaughtered that. But hey, metamorphosis, where we get that word. Greek word, Greek word, root word is morph. I can get that one. It means the real being of a man. Not the way we got our hair combed. Not the kind of deodorant that we use. Not the perfume we get cologne we got on. Not the brand name of clothes we got on. It's about us. One group of writers says it's the very nature and essence. The man in the evening clothes looks different than he does in work clothes. But on the inside, he's still the same man. Elderly man, the same man inwardly that he was as a young man. Now, Ronnie, every now and then I think about doing some of the stuff we used to do. And then I think better. Or, excuse me, some of the stuff you used to do. I just stood back and watched. Yeah. Man, look at Ronnie go. Too many times we let the world creep in and we become selfish. We become just worried about self. We come centered on the world, centered on the, this life. We can't be. There is a life to come. So let's start looking at uh, verse number 3. It tells us there, instead of being self, all about self, it tells us not to think of ourselves too highly. Now, that goes against a lot of things you learn. In, or, or, or they taught. I don't know if I learned it in school. Oh, you've got to have a good self-concept. I still remember sitting in the, one of the education classes. The professor said, uh, all right, everybody get you out a sheet of paper. And I thought, oh, no. Because every other time they told us to get out a sheet of paper, it was a test. Pop quiz. But on that day, he said, why don't you write down how a man can be a good man? 
Dr. W. that keep up, uh, I shared this not too long ago, that uh, he didn't, he was a Buddhist. He didn't appreciate my answer. My Bible says uh, there's none good, no, not one. There's none righteous, no, not one. Uh, there's, uh, they've all gone out of their way. They, there's no fear of God in their eyes. And that's man apart from Jesus. So what did I write that day on that piece of paper I took out? To be a good man, you got to know Jesus. And if I remember correctly, he read mine and then kind of disregarded most everything that that means. Verse 3 of Romans 12 says, For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly. That word soberly means to be balanced, to be sane, to be in one's right mind. Therefore, the exhortation here of being uh, sober involves this, to be wise the way we think of ourselves, to be accurate in the way that we think of ourselves, making a sane and well-balanced evaluation of one's person and ability. Each year, state of Tennessee, and it used to be in Alabama too. You had to do a you have to do a self evaluation of your teaching. And so, uh, at the end of the year, uh, the guy that evaluated me came in and said, uh, "This is what I got. Do you agree with it?" Well, some things I had a four on, he had a three. Some things I had a three on, he had a four. Four was the highest, by the way. Uh, neither one of us gave, gave me a two, and neither one of us gave me a one. So as far as that self-evaluation was, I must have been thinking like he did. And that's what it says here for us to do. Not to think of ourselves more highly than we should, but be to think soberly, well-balanced, According to God, according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Uh, now Amy may not realize she does this, but I want to give you a verse that my wife prays more often than any other verse. If you turn with me to James one and verse seventeen. Now, you might be like uh, some bus drivers. You might have a slack adjuster, but it's laying on the shelf somewhere. And you don't know how to use it. You don't know why it's there, but somebody gave you a slack adjuster, and you just don't, you like me, you don't have no idea what in the world that thing does. I guess it adjusts slack. I don't know. Whatever the slack's in. Maybe it's a belt. I don't know. But it was important for them bus drivers to know. James 1 and 17, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Now, you might have got a present from somebody in your life and, oh, this is just what I wanted. How did you know? Well, maybe you've left a little sticky notes everywhere. I don't know. Maybe like Ralphie, I want a red, red rider, double action BB gun, whatever it was. You just left notes everywhere. You know, they opened up the magazine. There was a red rider uh, advertisement. But every gift, every good gift, every perfect gift is from above, not from some individual but it's from above. And it cometh down from the Father of lights whom, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. 
So if you look back to Romans 12, let's look at a a few of these things here. It tells us that uh, in verse 4, that there are many members, and all those members don't have the same office. You know, uh, James and Jimmy. I've been there when I called a song number out and I hear somebody in the back of the church go, meaning this, not again. I've been there. I've been there when they said, uh, you need to sing some faster songs. You need to sing some slower songs. You need to sing this song. You need to sing that song. And what I've wanted to do is, uh, you come up and do it. But y'all know me. I probably, on most days, wouldn't have said it. But hey, there's that one or two days out of the year. If you'd said that to me, I'd have gave you the hymn book. You do it. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, all members have not the same office. Verse 5, so we being many are one body in Christ, and every one member is one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace which is given to us. Are you saved? Then grace has been given to you. Ephesians 2 and verse 8 says, it's, for, it's by uh, grace, through faith, that we're saved. Not, not of ourselves, it's a gift of God. And just to let you know, God gifts every child of his. Not just this one, not just that one. Each one of us that know him as our Lord and Savior have been gifted by God. Not a single believer has been omitted. Now, when Ronnie and I were in school, uh, some of us brought gloves to school. I didn't know. Why did I bring a glove? Because other people brought a glove. But did it do me any good? Now, that, that was occasion. You know, every once in a while I might have caught one when it just dropped in my glove. But, uh, but most of us, most of the time, there was a handful of us that might have had a glove. And what did we do when we went in to bat? What did we do? We handed it off to somebody. And then when we went back out in the field, what did they do? They gave it back, hopefully, unless you was one of them. I'm taking, I got mine, you ain't taking it. One of them people. But for the most part, it was just exchange. Now, some of us might know Where's your baseball glove at today? Where's your softball glove at today? I know where Jenna's is. I don't know where mine is. Jenna's in the bag in the garage. I have no idea where mine is. It's probably down mother and daddy's house somewhere. I ain't used it. You say, well, you ain't played in a while. Well, let's go down that road. God's given us something. Number one, do we know what it is? Number two, are we using it? Or is it like that slack adjuster? Nobody knew what it did, but hey, they could tell us where it was. I can't even tell you where my baseball glove is. Can I use it? I might catch one out of three. I don't know. But every one of us has a gift if we're a child of God. Let's look at uh, verse number six again. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, for the prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. What does that mean, prophecy? Well, we know from the Old Testament, prophecy meant that they got a word from God, and most of the time it was telling something that was about to happen. Some of it was immediate. Some of it 
years down the road, some of it has yet to be fulfilled yet. But I can guarantee you it's going to be because it's in God's Word. That's one kind of prophecy. But another kind of prophecy, New Testament, 1 Corinthians 14, 3, says, He that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. The prophet is the man who proclaims and explains the Word of God. The living Word, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and the written Word, the Holy Scripture. Verse 7, of ministry. He gives individuals amongst the church the gift of ministry. Now, I'm looking around this room this morning, and some of y'all might not realize it or not, but you've got the gift of ministry because I've watched you do it. I've been the recipient of your gift of ministry. You say, well, I had never taught. I had never preached. You know, that ain't all what ministry is all about. Let me tell you what ministry ain't, okay? Well, God bless you. Well, bless your heart. I'm praying for you. Just the words, I'm praying for you, ain't good enough. It's the praying that's the ministry. Not just the words. Ministry comes from the word that's often used of a servant or a person who serves and ministers to others in the most practical way. The meaning of that word would be uh, a special ability to serve, to minister, to aid, to help, to assist others, to assist them in such a way that they are built up and truly help. Now, uh, we're going to get down to exhortation here in just a minute, but that was part of the definition here. My girls tell me, Daddy, it's all in the way you say that. My wife tells me, Marty, it's all in the way you say that. Jimmy, I can say good morning and be aggravated. Oh, I can say good morning. And get a good morning back. I asked my teachers when I stood before them. I said this. I want to challenge y'all to do something. I mean, they knew me. They knew a smile was a rarity. Here's what I told them. Don't let me beat you in saying good morning when we meet each other in the hall. And by all means, don't let them students beat you in saying good morning when you meet them in the hall. Well, our first spell at Lexington School, good mornings were floating all around. I don't know if they still are or not. But I try to stand at my classroom door these days, and every child... For example, if tomorrow was a school day, happy Monday! And what I really like to do, Mr. Karen, is this. If it's Monday, happy Tuesday. To see who's going to stop and correct me. Several just walk by, but there'll be a handful that stops. And corrects me. So the gift of ministry, helping others, building up others. Let's look on down into verse 7. Ministry, let him wait on the ministry. And he that teaches, teacheth on teaching. Teaching is the ability to explain, root, and ground people into truth. It's not just uh, giving out a bunch of information, but it's explaining where something comes from. It's explaining what God's trying to tell us to say. 
1 Corinthians 12, 28, and God sent some of the church, some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, governments, the birthing of tongues. Ephesians 4 and 11, he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And what I like about Ephesians 4 and verse 11 is pastors and teachers they're not separated by comma. Now, ain't that newfangled English? Now, Bridget, back when I learned English, you put a comma before that last one. Now, it's option. I don't know who came up with that idea. It's option, but King James Version was back when you put it in there if you want it separated. Pastors and teachers are put together. Let's look at verse number 8. He that exhorteth, let him wait on exhortation. This is the very special ability to excite, to motivate, to advise, to encourage, to comfort, and to warn people. One feller that was like that was a feller by the name, according to what version of the Bible you got, if you got one version of the Bible, like I've got, his name was Joseph. If you've got a different translation of the Bible, his name was probably Joseph. If you look over with me to Acts chapter 4. Now, Anna texted me last night and said, I met one of your co-workers and students. I said, who? And I could tell that she was smiling as she texted this back to me. I met Briley of the Lee family. Y'all know any of the Lee family? Their parents are apparently, and if they're there, they're presently, and if they're not, absently. And got a bunch of the Lee families in my classroom, but she met one of them, Briley. Matter of fact, I think in that class I had two named Briley of the Lee family. Uh, Acts chapter 4, verse number 36. Uh, after all these years, I still, this was, my, this was my 31st year in education. I still give my students uh, nicknames. And that's what they did to this fellow by the name of Joseph. Or Joseph, if you've got a different translation of the Bible. Verse 36, Acts chapter 4, it says this. And Joseph's who by the apostles were was surnamed Barnabas. Now, I've had a student by the name of uh, Philip 66. Y'all know the gas station? And he was named Philip 66 because his last name was Floyd. No, his last name was Philip. I had a student by the name, I, I nicknamed Sherwood, y'all remember where Robin Hood lived? Sherwood Forest? Well, her name was Sherwood Forest Er. It took me a while to get her to understand that. But finally, I reckon she read up on Robin Hood and understood. Why was Barnabas nicknamed Barnabas? We could go through the book of Acts, and you could see Paul was converted on the road, road to Damascus. Paul was the one who had Christians drugged to different places, stoned to death. He didn't actually do the stoning, but hey, he had the papers in hand. He caused it to happen. Matter of fact, the first, one of the first deacons of the church, Stephen, he was there. He did not throw a rock, but hey, they laid their coats down at his feet as they threw the rocks that stoned Stephen to death. He was all right with it. Bible says, King James Version, he was consenting to it. So when Paul was converted, somebody had to stand up for him. Good old Barnabas put his arm around him and said, I've heard him speak in the name of Jesus. He's okay. They went on a missionary journey, and a fellow by the name of John Mark. We know him as the Apostle John. We know him as Apostle John, I believe. No, we know him as Mark out of the gospel. John was James' brother. We know John Mark as Mark. 
And what happened to him? J. Vernon McGee's theory is he was a mama's boy. Now, we went to see the Savannah Bananas the other night. And uh, I just knew this fella, well, I don't know if he gave the child candy. I don't know what happened. But anyway, one of the first things they did during a little break was they had uh, a couple come out toting a two-year-old child. And uh, they told mom and daddy to go down toward home plate. And uh, I was surprised the little girl stayed with the announcer. But anyway, she did. And he said, all right, you run to them. And whichever one she goes to is going to get to throw a pie in the other's face. I just knew daddy was going to get a pie. But who'd she go to? She went to daddy. I don't know if he slipped her some candy. He got hundred dollars. I don't know what he did. But he, she went to him, and Mama got a pie in her face. And Johnna, guess what? She threw the pan at the daddy and got it on his shirt. I guess she might have thought she was going to win. John Mark went home to Mama. J. Vernon McGee said, didn't say he went home. He went home to Daddy. Went home to Mama because he was apparently a Mama's boy. And it came time that Paul said, Barnabas, let's go back and visit the churches that we've seen. Let's go back and see how everybody's doing. And Barnabas said, hey, let's take old John Mark with us. No, he's done deserted us once. Uh -uh. They split ways. Paul took Silas. Barnabas took John Mark. Later in life, we see in Paul's writings, he tells them, you bring John Mark with you because he's profitable for me for the ministry. And if it hadn't been for Barnabas, and J. Vernon McGee's right, he'd still been at Mama's house, instead of doing the work of the Lord. So, and Joseph, or Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being, which is being interpreted the son of the consolation or the son of exhortation, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Exhortation, again, the ability to excite, motivate, advise, encourage, comfort, warn people. The dominant factor would be the motivation and encouragement of people. Friends, y'all know the golden rule? When I first went to Lexington, Amy and I took several Sunday nights and went and visited different churches in the community. We were attending uh, First Baptist Anderson at the time. We went and I saw students from Lexington at this church, that church. I'd preached at some of the churches and knew who went to what church. And this young lady was sent to the office one day. Who I'd seen in church like two weeks before. On Sunday night of all time. And I can't remember what she'd done, but I remember plainly what I asked her and what her response was. I said, what, what does the golden rule say? Here's her response. And I thought, oh my goodness, are we still teaching the golden rule? Because she had no idea what I was talking about. So I told her, I said, uh, this is what the golden rule says. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So had kids in the office, use that. You want me to hit you? Then you quit hitting people. You want me to talk about you? Then you quit talking about people. Of course, that was involved too a lot of times in the Use the sounded louder than that, but I'd get my point across. You like good things said to you? Well, say some good things to people, but be careful. If you hadn't got the gift of exhortation, you might be like yours truly. Morning. Why are you so mad today? 
Nothing bad. You sure do sound like it. Good morning. You say, well, that's a terrible attempt, Marty, but better than the first one, wasn't it? Exhortation. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 and verse 2, Preach the word, be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and doctrine. The next one is giving. Sitting in church service one, one day, it's good to have brother and sister so-and-so visiting with us. They gave us a $500 check in the offering today. And I kind of look, look around. Uh, you know, I'd like to have $500 I could write to the church. It's good to have brother so-and-so with us today. He got, he's done gave us $10,000 to pay the parking lot. Well, let's look at this right here just, just a minute now. So he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. Let him do it with simplicity. The word translated given simply means the giving of one's earthly possessions such as money, clothing, food. This particular gift, Scripture adds a point. Do it with simplicity. Do it with singleness of heart, without show. Give liberally, generously. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, don't blast a trumpet before you when you do it. And by the way, knowing those people that was announced that they'd done this, that, and the other. They weren't the type of people that wanted that horn hooted for them. They gave out of the goodness of their heart. He that ruleth, Romans 12 and verse 8, he that ruleth, let him do it with diligence. Word translated ruling means the ability of leadership, authority, administration, government. This person is to lead with diligence, meaning with haste, zeal, desire, and concentrated attention. Romans 12 and verse 11 says this, Not slothful in business, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Then there's one more. So if you're checking off, hey, we're at the last one, and I ain't going to do 30 more minutes, okay? Promise you. Down to the last point here, verse number 8. He that shows mercy. What is mercy? Well, one definition is this. When we get mercy from God... It means that God's not given us what we deserve. It means that God loves us enough that he has provided a way that we don't get what we deserve. Because what we deserve is hell. Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Romans 5, 8 says, But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One commentator writes this, that God has a never-ending river full of mercy. I don't know about you. I'm thankful that he gave me mercy. And you've heard me say this many, many times. If we've, if we've received mercy, let's give mercy. If we've received grace, which is mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve if we enjoy that grace. 
give that grace. And if we enjoy the love of God, then by all means, let's love one another. So he that showeth mercy, let him do it with cheerfulness. Mercy. Elion. This is a person who is full of forgiveness and compassion, pity and kindness toward others. Let her do it with cheerfulness. Cheerfulness. I'm not going to tempt that one. That's a, that's, a, that's a nice word. But the word means kind, cheerful, joyful. The person with the gift of mercy is not to forgive grudgingly. grudgingly. He's not to hesitate in forgiving others. He's not to show mercy in an, an annoyed spirit. He's not to show mercy in a spirit of criticism and rebuke toward the person that needs help. One day I was lost, and I needed some mercy. And he not only gave me mercy, but he loved me enough to give me grace. And for that, I'm most thankful. Daddy, does your children know your gift? Or is it like that slack adjuster on that bus? He, I think he, he's saved. He, I think he's got one, but he's... If we're to be the men of God that God has saved us to be. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Don't be like slack adjuster. Be on duty. Be at work for our Heavenly Father. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your many blessings. Thank you for allowing us to be gathered as we are today. Had your way in each one of our lives during this invitation time. If there's any that's lost and undone without you, we ask you to save them. For it's everlasting too late. And Lord, us, your children. Lord, there was, you talked about three people that was given something. One of them returned tenfold. One of them returned fivefold. The other one kept it wrapped up in a napkin. Lord, the gift that you've given us, help us to get it out of that napkin if that's where it's at. And help us to put it to use for you. Have your way and your will in each one of our lives. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as Melanie.